All right. All right. Hello everyone. Uh, today we have Nima Lashkari, who's going to tell us about summing states in QFT. Um, Nima, thank you very much, and take it away. Thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, so it's my first experience with this online talks. We'll see how it goes. Hopefully, um, it's the the uh, my handwriting is legible. So if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. The talk is going to be somewhat uh, of mathematical nature but I'll try to uh, take a physical perspective and use the language that's more familiar for physicists. So uh, the title of the talk is Sewing States of Quantum Field Theory. And uh, the, one of the main, an important result of the talk is going to be a surprising phenomenon that happened that's specific to quantum field theory states and that you would have missed out if you had thought of quantum field theory as a regular quantum mechanical system with density matrices. So that's going to be where we're going to towards. And uh, the importance of this surprising phenomenon um, is gonna be reflected in entanglement theory. So this is the context. So let's start, let's start with a simple example. Uh, more familiar, we're gonna start with quantum mechanics. So every time I talk about quantum mechanics, uh, but by that I mean finite quantum systems so that are described by density matrices. So um, let's imagine, let's start with an n partite quantum system. So the Hilbert space is uh, some H1 tensor H2. I, I guess you see my, bra uh, my mouse, I guess. Yeah, we can see your pointer. Okay, so you good, see. very good. So um, there's a Hilbert space H1, Hilbert space H2, all the way to Hn. And uh, they are um, isomorphic to each other. For simplicity, let's assume that. Then I will use the language of omega. So omega one is going to be the density matrix of H1. Omega two is the density matrix of uh, H2 and so on and so forth. So uh, I use the language of a local state every time I talk about a density matrix um, on HI, for example. So the, the relevance of that is gonna become clear when we talk about quantum field theory. And uh, there will be, so the question of sewing, the problem of sewing that's going to be central for us uh, for this talk is that given a set of omega one to omega n density matrices, is there a global pure state, n partite pure, pure state, ket omega of a one to a n that reduces to these density matrices for, uh, that's consistent with each of them, which means that it reduces to uh, omega i on site i. So you take ket pra omega omega, partial trace out everything else, and you end up with omega i. So that's the question. And roughly speaking, if the answer is in positive, uh, is uh, affirmative, then the physical interpretation of such a global state is a quote unquote mean field theory state. Um, all right, so let's work out some examples to get, become familiar with the setup. The simplest case is when n is equal to two, so we have a bipartite system, A and A bar, each described with density matrices. Now, if any global state, I'm sorry, by global state I meant always, I'm, I'm restricting myself always to pure states, that's going to be essential. Otherwise, the problem in quantum mechanics is gonna be trivial. Um, you just tensor all the density matrices and that's your state. So we're, we're by, by global, by uh, these these global vectors we're talking about are pure. Um, so if omega ket omega is a pure state of the bipartite system, it admits a Schmidt decomposition and a particular basis that I've denoted by K K, um, and the Schmidt eigenvalues the, uh, are going to be P Ks. Now, if you take this bipartite pure state and reduce it to density matrices omega A and omega A bar, you immediately realize that the spectrum of the two density matrices are always the same. This suggests that you will be able to sew omega one to omega two if and only if the density matrices have the same eigenvalues. Another thing that is important is that um, you have to, you can, you can immediately also notice that there, there are no other obstructions because if you can say, so omega one to omega two, you can so omega one to u omega two u dagger, where u is localized on a bar. 
So I can always rotate each of the density matrices locally. So with a un local unitary that's localized on A or A bar, and uh, that will not change the sewing problem. So the sewing problem, if it imposes any constraints, is always going to be a constraints on eigenvalues of the density matrices. So in anticipation for what goes crazy in quantum field theory is that in quantum field theory, there won't be density matrices, and there won't, which basically means that there won't be eigenvalues, any sensible way of talking about eigenvalues. That is why things become funky in quantum field theory. All right, so let's continue with our quantum mechanics example. Let's go to a three, n equal three, and for simplicity, let's restrict to the case where we have qubits. So we have three qubits, Every three qubit density matrix on site i, I can omega i, I can write it as some lambda zero zero plus one minus lambda one one in some one and zero basis. Now I choose my convention so that lambda is always the smaller uh, eigenvalue, so it's between zero and a half. Then we can show it's not hard, uh, it's pretty straightforward to show that there exists a global pure state that shows them if and only if the following three inequalities are satisfied. Oops, sorry, I think if I move my mouse too much, it goes to the next page. So it's, um, it's they're, they're all like triangle type inequalities. Well, okay, let me, let me not try to uh, give it that interpretation. So it's basically of, the, of this type that lambda one plus lambda two has to be larger or equal to lambda three and all the permutations of the, this inequality. So from this structure, you could generalize. These are, uh, by the way, there is a reference. Uh, the reference is a, a recent paper that I wrote on archive. Uh, I do not remember the archive number, but uh, it's my latest paper is called Sewing States of Quantum Field Theory. So all the details of these arguments or the references um, are, could be found in the paper and the references in that paper. So for n qubits, the generalization is exactly works the same way. So qubits is here essential um, to make a simple and compact statement. Then you can sew omega one to omega n the n, uh, qubit density matrices if and only if for all j's the sum of the other eigenvalues is larger or equal to um, lambda j. So this is just a generalization of the previous condition that you can, you can figure this out. You can, you can show that it continues to hold. So these inequalities are a set of constraints that we're just discussing right now. But if you were to just develop a theory of multi-parted entanglement, they play a crucial role in the development of such a theory. So I will come back to this. But maybe, maybe I should comment on this that um, Above bipartite uh, entanglement, when you come to tripartite, pure, genuinely tripartite, uh, four partite or higher partite uh, entanglement, there are several different types of entanglement structures that are inequivalent. And uh, there are different inequivalent classes of entanglement. And within each class, you satisfy a weaker or stronger different sets of inequalities of this sense. So sewing problem sort of sits at the heart of um, multi-party entanglement theory, at least in quantum mechanics. All right, so now let's move on to quantum field theory. What we would like to do is we would like to repeat the same analysis I have a quantum question. field theory. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so what is your motivation for looking at sewing states in quantum field theory? So the motivation is to understand um, the entanglement theory of quantum fields. So um, there are many uh, reasons to do, you would like to do that. Uh, for example, uh, classifying uh, various phases of quantum field theory, searching for universal structure that you suspect has to do only with correlations and not the, the, uh, the nature of the degrees of freedom, for instance, some um, say st different strongly coupled quantum field theories might show a certain behavior that um, is encoded only in the correlations and not the actual local degrees of freedom. Um, and an instance of this would be holography. A lot of holographic theories are believed to have very similar entanglement structure of states from which the geometry is reconstructed. 
but the whatever the details of the UV details of what the building blocks are does not necessarily matter. Does that answer your question? Uh, right. But so just to follow up. So, but this uh, global state is not likely to be unique for a given set of uh, density. Sorry, say it again. So, so the global state that is consistent with a given set of density matrices is not correct. Likely to be unique. Correct. So then when you say things like uh, you, you, you want to like define this global state and then look at the entanglement of this global state, but then this is not unique, right? So how, how, how do you go from? Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll come back to this, but let me, let me actually, uh, uh, yeah. So hopefully by the end, of, if I do not answer, give a sharp answer to this, uh, definitely ask this again, but I think it's going to become clear as I go ahead. So for now, you can think about that that I'm zooming in on a feature that has to do with entanglement entropy and the structure of correlations that is completely different in quantum field theories than what we would have expected from a finite quantum system. But for the moment, it could, the discussion could be at this level. And then I come to applications or discussions at the end, maybe. Okay. So now let's say, um, so here I'm drawing some um, quantum field theory state. This is time, this is space. Let's say it's X is just a bunch of um, a particular direction. It doesn't really matter. You take a Cauchy slice and split it into N non-overlapping regions that um, the union of which is the whole space, uh, Cauchy slice. Now in quantum field theory, there are no local density matrices. However, there are local algebras, A1, there's, a, there's an algebra associated with A1, uh, an algebra associated with A2, and so on and so forth. And the notion of a local state continues to exist, not as a density matrix, but as a linear positive map from the local algebra to expectation values. So you, have, you still have the local algebra, you still have expectation values, and it's a linear map. It has to be positive, meaning that if A is an operator in the local algebra, A dagger A, the expectation value of A dagger A has to be non-negative. This is the constraint, this is what it means to be positive. So you can formally think of, not actually, I shouldn't say formally, the, replace, the replacement of density matrices in quantum field theory is this linear positive map. Indeed, this linear positive map is the way that, uh, is any local state in any quantum system, quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, this is always true. It's, it's a special feature of finite quantum systems that this linear map could be represented using a D by D density matrix. In quantum field theory, that step fails, but this linear positive map works. So to work out an example, uh, well, this linear map is just, could be thought of, let's say you have a vacuum state in your quantum field theory. This vacuum is defined everywhere in the Hilbert space. If you restrict this, vac this vacuum, so the local algebra, this gives you a linear map, this is positive, which is positive, and this is one instance of it. So what we were gonna be thinking about when we talk about quantum field theory, where every time we talk about vectors in the Hilbert space, there exists one of it, and that is the vector space, uh, the Hilbert space is spanned by the global pure states. And when we talk about local states, we're talking about this map, which is the restrictions of various things to local algebras. All right. Um, yeah, so now in quantum field theory, the problem is exactly the same given omega one to omega n uh, as local states. Is there a global vector, global state that reduces to them, that sows them, right? And here, re reducing means precise the restriction, right? So the surprising result that we're gonna see is that in quantum field theory, as opposed to what we just said in quantum mechanics, there always exists a global state that sows arbitrary local states with arbitrary precision. So meaning that um, if, there, if you allow a teeny tiny fudge factor in each of these guys, you can always sow them. And that fudge factor could be chosen to be arbitrarily small. So in what norm and all that, this is gonna be part of the discussion. So one particular consequence of this is the example of n equal two that we worked out. So for the case of, if you remember, for the case of bipartite system, we said that sewing is 
possible if and only if the eigenvalues are the same. Here, what you observe is that if you psi is some global state and omega is some other global state, and I split my, my space time into left and right wedge, and now omega reduces to this local state, this guy reduces to this local state. If I take psi and subtract from it uh, omega, let's say the vacuum state, acted with, oops, sorry, acted with, uh, unitary on the left and a unitary on the right and take an infimum over u and u prime, I get zero, which means that if I start in the vacuums of, of so this is one of the instances that you might be interested in the, this result. If you, this statement says, if you take the vacuum of quantum field theory and act with a unitary in the left wedge and a unitary on the right wedge, you can prepare your favorite state of quantum field theory with arbitrary precision. So notice that u and u prime, of course, cannot entangle left and the right. Or the, if there were density matrices, if there were Rennie entropies, they would not ever change Rennie entropies. So what this is telling you is that this is one manifestation that all calculations of entanglement entropy and Rennie entropy in quantum field theory are not really rigorous or sensible. So the, you, have to, you have to talk about quant. So it's just, it's referring to the fact that um, entanglement entropy or Rennie, uh, Rennie entropy is a property of the algebra and not the states. If you try to attach a, a number associated with um, particular Rennie to a density, to a, to a state, it will be the same for all, almost all states, for a dense set of states. All right. So that's the main result. Are there questions about the... This. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, can I ask about the algebra? Like, should I think uh -huh. of it as the, uh, like just a algebra of local operators in my QFT? Correct. So for instance, uh, the local algebra, let's say it's, if it's a case of fermions for simplicity, let's say it's one plus one dimensional fermions, then the local algebra is generated in the following way. You take your fermion, psi of x, and um, put next to it some uh, uh, function that's only supported on, on AI and integrate. So it's just, you know, you, you, take your, you, you take your field function and integrate next to it arbitrary functions that are supported only on AI. Okay, such, so an, such, an oper such operators generate a local algebra. Okay, so sort of like wave packets, right? Correct except that they have to literally vanish outside of um, AI. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, they have to be perfectly localized, yes. And there, the, the, there always exist such things in quantum field theory. Okay. So that was uh, one, of the, one of the results, but that's what we're gonna discuss for the rest of the talk, but an important piece is that, okay, so this was known to mathematicians since 1979, maybe not in this language, but it was known to mathematicians. But what is sort of new in this work, or new at least to the math community, is that the unitary that actually so states in quantum field theory is known. We, I, I, we can construct it. And it's the thing that is called the Cohn's co-cycle. So, uh, let me first explain the notation. We're going to come back to this and explain the whole concept in detail and the physics of it. So it's a unitary flow that you could define for a fixed choice of region, any two states. So it's a one parameter family. So it's a unitary flow, right? It's a one parameter family of uh, unitaries. There's a T in there. For any choice of two states, psi and omega, and a region A, uh, you can define such a thing. And the limit of t going to infinity of this object is the thing that sows psi to omega on region A. This is going to be one important, cons uh, one important uh, result. So now the, there's, a fine, there's, a, there's a fine line, there's a, a footnote to this, which is this is going to be 
uh, that's going to be important for the math result, but for physicists, probably doesn't quite matter all that much. It's an issue of order of limits and which norm you're, you're talking about. The statement is going to be holding in the weak norm. So we'll come back to this. So just like a, a, a few comments about maybe that would address the question that was asked earlier about the physics of this result. So um, a bunch of physical comments. So let's say I have a state on the left wedge and a state on the right wedge. So these are Rindler wedges, which is like uh, I've, picked, I've uh, sing singled out a particular space, time, space direction x1 and the, the, there could be perpendicular direction uh, direction perpendicular to the board here then you saw an arbitrary state on the left an arbitrary state on the right and typically there is a shock in the limit of t going to infinity typically there is a shock here sitting here and of course for every finite and oops sorry any any finite and large t there won't be a shock but as t goes to infinity it will develop a shock Another thing that's interesting, which at the first look, a lot of people get surprised by, but it's not uh, it's consistent with everything we know in physics and people have studied this for a while, is that you, not only you can store different states of quantum field theory, but also you can store different quantum field theories together. For instance, you can store the vacuum of C equal one uh, free bosons to some excited state or the vacuum of N equal four super Yang mills. And of course, in these cases, again, typically in this limit, there is a shock. There, there are actually Lagrangian constructions you could do such things. This is exactly these, um, but okay, let me not comment on this. This is like a, there's a huge topic in quantum field theory associated to sewing. They don't use the language of sewing, but it's, uh, these are different boundary conditions that people talk about. Here, here there's no, we're not imposing any boundary conditions. We're just doing this algebraically. So why is sewing important? This I, I said it before, but let's just repeat it again. If you are familiar with the theory of multi-particle quantum entanglement, um, one, of the, an one, of, one of the important observations in the theory of quantum multi-particle quantum entanglement is that there are inequivalent class of entanglement that satisfies that satisfy different types of inequalities for their lambda i's, different kind of sewing constraints. Here, we're gonna see that there are no traces. In quantum field theory, there are no traces of um, such constraints. And the fact that in quantum mechanics, there are such, such constraints is one of the things that make multi-particle quantum entanglement hard to tame. It's very, very complicated and it's hard to tame. Now in quantum field theory, this our result suggests that maybe multi-particle entanglement in quantum field theory is much more tractable and easier to study. Nobody has really, to my knowledge, nobody has really attempted this in a systematic way. Um, so this is going to be what we're gonna be pushing for going forward. But let me also just uh, draw one, there are many, many ways that this enters, uh, this result enters questions that uh, high energy physicists might, might care about. But one particular case is, let me, this defines a, something that's called I'm calling quote unquote disentangler. Take the uh, Cauchy slice and split it into A, B, and C. Oops, sorry, it keeps jumping. Now, this tells you that there exists a unitary on AC that disentangles A and C. And this unitary we're constructing explicitly. So, we, this is like taking quantum field theory and knowing explicitly how to decouple different pieces of it, disentangle this. So th this type of arguments were used in holography um, to, to discuss this like ER equal EPR type arguments or the um, connecting the connectivity of space time to um, entanglement. These type of arguments disentangling regions of space were used. Here is a sharp construction that achieves similar things. Okay, so um, now it's time to start getting our hands dirty. Um, by the way, actually I should keep an eye on the time. Um, all right, I see the time. Um, okay, so for, for the most part, because um, it's already pretty complicated, I will be um, talk, focusing on n equal to two. 
And I will use the intuition of density matrices. Actually, for the most part, I will use density matrices, but I will particularly, I'll handpick the statements that smoothly generalize from density matrices to quantum field theory. So often a physicist thinks of quantum field theory as the continuum limit of a lattice system. Lattice systems at any cutoff do have density matrices. So roughly speaking, the physicists think that they take a limit of this, uh, this finite, finite quantum system and they obtain quantum field theory. This limit is very, very special. It's not true that all the features that we're, we're holding at finite, uh, at finite uh, lattice size will continue to have a nice limit as you take the cutoff away. A lot of things, including entanglement measures, they blow up. And, in, and, uh, and uh, eigenvalues, they all go to zero. So uh, this is sort of the origin of the problem, but I will, I will focus on the phenomena. I can describe the phenomena I'm interested in by using only density matrices because I think that's more familiar. So I will, I'll focus uh, on a few concepts, mostly from information theory, and, but uh, we'll, we'll go through that, and if there are questions, please stop me. So an important concept is going to be a can, the notion of a canonical purification. I'm given a density matrix. I'm gonna write it immediately in its diagonal basis. Here is a spectrum, eigenvalues, which is a probability distribution, and the eigenvalues. Such a density matrix, if it's bipartite, for, again, uh, for the rest of the talk, unless I mention that n is larger than 2, well, I'm assuming that we're discussing bipartite setup. This, this density matrix could be understood as a reduced state of a global pure state, which is psi, uh, ket psi, sorry, ket omega, which is the sum of square root p k k k k. This is the region A with this omega of A, and this is the purification. Now it's clear that purification is highly non-unique. If I apply a unitary on a uh, bar, that will con this continues to hold. Uh, this continues to be the reduced density matrix. However, notice that that, um, that unitary is not gonna change the, the spectrum. So we want to somehow, so this, this particular state I wrote is special in the way it treats the state and its purification. It has some sort of a symmetry. What is that symmetry? It's something like a swap symmetry. So if you take a k, k prime, this is the, uh, and swap them to k prime k, this state is gonna be, stay, this, this, this pure state is going to be symmetric under such a transformation. So when I define this symmetry, I, I have the choice of realizing it as a unitary or an anti-unitary. That's, uh, that's the resulting quantum mechanics. We choose to represent this symmetry using an anti, oops, sorry, oh, sorry, an anti-unitary that we call modular conjugation. So this, oh God, sorry. This C becoming C, uh, C is just some complex number becoming C star is, I, I put it in there to just remind you that this is an anti-linear or anti-unitary transformation. It's called modular conjugation. And, the canonical purification is the particular purification of omega that is symmetric under J omega. Meaning that J omega acting on omega gives you omega. Now, okay, so I, I chose that. Now, um, I pick a second density matrix psi. Again, I diagonalize it. There will be new eigenvalues and new basis that I'm writing with alpha of K. But it's because this is a density matrix of the same Hilbert space, I still use the index K to, uh, to, to label eigenvalues. Now, um, there is still a purification of psi that is uh, symmetric under the old J omega. So now, um, what, what is that? You could, so th that will depend obviously on omega, right? And you could explicitly work it out. It's the one psi omega is when you take uh, the canonical purification of omega and act on it with the density matrix of the of psi squared. Sorry, to the power of half, tensor density matrix of omega to the power of minus half. I mean, uh, hopefully, it's clear that the the um, 
the little, uh, the, the, this omega is the density matrix of this, and this guy is the density matrix of this guy. So we say, for, for, to simplify our life, we only talk about canonical purification of states, meaning that we take a state, particularly vacuum or something, define modular conjugation, and every time we talk about purification of states, of vectors in the Hilbert space that reduce the particle density matrix, we're gonna choose them such that they're symmetric under this guy. This J omega has the property that if you uh, sandwich this antilinear, if you sandwich the, uh, the algebra of the left with this, it gives you operators on the right. So it takes you from A to A bar. Okay. Um, so this is the first concept. The second concept that we're gonna be using a lot is um, Frobenius distance. So this is, the question is that given two density matrix, what norm do you wanna use to tell, to tell them apart? How far are they from each other? Because I said, I, at the beginning, I said that um, this is going to be, I can, I can sow states with arbitrary precision. So now, what is the notion of a precision? I need to define a measure of distance measure between density matrices. So given two density matrices, the Frobenius uh, distance is just half of the, um, the trace distance or the one norm distance of omega, square root omega and square root psi. This could be squared. This could be repackaged as one minus trace of square root omega, square root psi. So let me not elaborate on this much because this is a well-known measure in quantum information theory. If you just Google for mini assistance, you're gonna get all sorts of properties and nice features it has. But for us, what that matters is that the Frobenius distance for finite quantum systems becomes equal to the Hilbert space distance norm of psi omega minus omega. It's important in this that these are canonical purifications. So why is this gonna be important? Because in quantum field theory, I don't have density matrices to define something like this, but I do have this guy. So we're gonna still continue to talk about Frobenius distance and canonical purification is gonna be important for us. Another notion that's important is, I'll use this later, as strong versus weak norm. So if I have a vector chi, so this is something that becomes important only in infinite dimensions. And this is actually exactly why um, finite quantum system intuition doesn't quite work and when it comes to quantum field theory in certain instances. So if you have a state chi, the norm of the state chi is the supremum of the overlap of chi with any other state, normalized states. Of course, this will be, um, this, the supremum is achieved when phi is equal to chi, right? Because um, otherwise this is related to the cosine of theta, the angle that the vectors make with each other. And when, when they're parallel to each other, this is just maximum. Now, if the, the issue is that, let's say you have a sequence of states chi t. For example, you take chi and act with it with a one parameter family of unitary transformations and you generate a flow of states. Now, limit of t going to infinity, for example, of the norm might not be equal to the norm of limit of t going to infinity of chi t. So what does that mean? It means that the supremum and this limit need not commute. One very simple instance where this happens is take the Hilbert space of square integrable functions on a circle. Take your one parameter family of states to be one over two pi e to the power of i t x. It's just simply a momentum mode. Now, the right-hand side is the supremum over phi limit of t of the overlap of phi and chi t. This is going to be zero by the uh, uh, Riemann-Hilbert theorem, lemma, which says that if you have a square integrable function, the infinite momentum, so this overlap tells you, uh, isolates a particular mode, right? A particular momentum mode. So, when you take t to infinity, it, this result is the infinite momentum mode of phi. The Riemann-Hilbert uh, theorem or lemma says that a square integrable function 
um, cannot have an infinite momentum mode. So, so on the right hand side, you find zero, whereas on the left hand side, it's trivially one because all you did with, but on chi is just you act up with unitaries that do not change the norm. So the limit and the supremum need not commute, and this is going to be important for us. If you're a physicist that don't, that doesn't care about, who doesn't care about these kind of things, that's perfectly fine. You can ignore it for the rest of the talk. But I had to say it to be precise. Okay. There is one last notion that I have to introduce, so that I don't. And this, these are all notions that I can define in quantum field theory if I use the machinery of Tomita Takesaki modular theory. They're very natural objects, but I'm trying to avoid that because I think that might uh, that has a little bit of a steep learning curve. So the notion that we're going to talk about is relative modular operator, and I want to motivate this using finite quantum systems. So what is this guy? It's, a, it's an operator uh, that is defined on the, say, uh, on the biparte quantum, um, on the biparte Hilbert space of psi and omega, and it's just psi tensor omega. So we saw earlier that the canonical purification is related, the canonical purification of psi is created using the action of the, this relative modular operator to a power of half acting on the vector. In particular, this is useful because now I can take my uh, distance measure, which was the distance between the two canonical purifications, and write it as a measure, uh, write it this way, because I just uh, take the uh, mod relative modular operator bar of half out of this, and I find it this way, I write it this way. Now, this tells me that this is going to be about, uh, this, this measure becomes small when the spread of the spectrum of the relative modular operator is focused around one. If the, so this, this operator has a spectrum which is positive from zero to infinity. If the spectrum is highly concentrated, it's a self-adjoint operator, if the spectrum of it is highly concentrated around one, this measure is small. So again, to reiterate the main results, um, what we're going to say is that in quantum field theory, the infimum over unitaries of this distance measure, u, psi, u, dagger, and omega, is going to be zero. And the u, the particular u that achieves this minimum in the weak norm that we're going to define, is the so-called co-cycle, is this unitary flow that is nothing but so this is a relative modular operator. If I take that, this is a positive operator. If I take it to a power of it, that generates for me a unitary flow. So there's a particular combination of these guys, which is, this is a relative modular flow. If you pick the both of the states to be the same, that's called modular flow. So this guy evolves with the relative modular flow of psi omega for it, and evolves back, well actually, sorry, evolves back with modular flow of omega for, my, for, for t, and then evolves forward, oops, um, with a relative modular operator for it. So this is, what, what is the physics of co-cycle on its own could be full talk. But at the moment, I, all I wanted to do was that I wanted to define for you guys what this is. So clearly, if you have two density matrices, you have their spectra, you can just take, construct this object forward. I'm sorry. Now, all right, so this was a lot of uh, formal comments. Now, let's come back and try to, to find a quantum systems and try to calculate this guy explicitly. What we want to do is that we have two density matrices, psi and omega. We want to unitarily rotate psi and see how close they become. And keep in mind that this measure for the density matrices when one was one minus trace of square root of psi and omega. So a simple way to upper bound this guy is that pick a unitary that simultaneously diagonalizes the two density matrices. In that case, what you find, this is an upper bound because there's an infimum over u, it's a particular instance of u, so it's gonna be an upper bound. And in this particular case, it's gonna become mi one minus sum, sum, of over k of square root p k q k because that's what these guys are gonna come down to. So this is an upper bound. It's not a very exciting upper bound, 
So you used up a unitary to simultaneously diagonalize it. You could ask whether you could do better. Indeed, you could do better because there's still unitaries that will uh, permute the basis. So um, you could, you could, there will be all sorts of permutations of the same basis, permutations of diagonal density matrices. These are generated by unitaries and you could take a supremum over all these guys. Turns out that if you, that such a supremum, of course, is, um, is gonna provide an upper bound. Turns out that in finite quantum system, this is actually an equality. If you take the supremum, if you, it's an equality. And what is, that, what is that such a supremum? What you want to do is that you want to change, take K and reorder them. You want to take PKs, reorder them such that this guy is cl as close as possible to one. Well, the answer, the thing that achieves such a supremum is that just take both of them and order them in decreasing order. So these are eigenvalues, just order them P0, P1 and Q1 are going to be the highest eigenvalue and then just go down. Once you order them in a particular order, decreasing or increasing, doesn't matter. It has to be the same order. When you order them in that way, then this is going to be maximal. This is going to be supreme. Uh, this is going to achieve the supremum, which is the infimum of the whole thing. And it's clear that this is going to be zero if and only if for every PK, there is a QK that's equal to it. Or said otherwise, the density matrices have the same eigenvalues. This is just reproducing the very, very first result that we talked about, right? But a little bit formally. Now, one thing to remember is that the spectrum of the relative modular operator is PK over QK prime. Oh, I'm sorry, there, there should be a minus one here. I'm so sorry, there has to be a minus one here. That's a terrible typo. So psi tensor omega minus one, inverse. Um, there's an inverse here. I apologize. All right. Um, are there questions so far? No questions from Boston. All right. Other people online have a question. Feel free to uh, unmute and interrupt. All right. So if there are no other questions, I'll continue. Um, how much time do I have actually left? 9.42, okay. Yeah, about 15 minutes. All right, very good. I should be in good shape for that. All right, so now let's define uh, the following thing. You take a local density matrix or local state, if I'm thinking of quantum field theory, you rotate it by unitaries, local unitaries. And let's call that a unitary orbit. The unitary orbits form equivalence classes. So, you, and usually in finite quantum system, these equivalent classes are uh, classified, are labeled by the eigenvalues because using unitaries, you cannot change eigenvalues, right? So, so I'm gonna use the notation of omega uh, in some uh, brackets as the equivalence class, unitary equivalence classes. And the infimum over unitaries, when I wanna discuss the distance of them, to density matrices is like defining a density a distance for unitary equivalence classes. That is what it is. So now we can do it in two different ways. We can define a strong distance and a weak distance. Again, if this is too formal, by all means feel to ignore it, but I think it's a very simple instance of functional analysis. So let's define the strong distance using the infimum and the norm. Remember the norm itself was a supremum, right? So this is inf sup. The weak distance is gonna be the opposite, sup inf. And we argued that in general, in infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, they need not be the same. So turns out that actually, let me say, say it beforehand, the strong distance and weak distance of uh, unitary orbits in quantum field theory, both of them vanish. However, the weak distance has the benefit that you could explicitly construct a unitary that makes the states come close. The strong distance, the unitary that you could construct is not terribly explicit. It's, it's pretty hard to construct. It's the discussion of the details of how it's done is in the paper, or uh, it was done also in the Cone Stormer paper in 1979 in a language that is a lot more abstract than the language that's in my paper, but anyway. 
So yeah, in one case, you're taking an infimum over U as supremum afterwards, and then the other one, you swap the, the these two. So this is a stronger one, meaning that if, this, if you're close in strong distance, you're close in weak distance, but not the other way around. So what Cohn and Storm approved in 1979, Cohn, Alan Cohn of uh, operated algebra, the famous person, and the Stormer is, Stormer is some uh, mathematical phys or mathematician um, in operative algebra. What they showed is that the infimum over u, u prime, u belonging to left algebra, u prime belonging to right algebra, can bring any two states close by or make the distance zero. This, when we were talking about this, this was a strong distance, which is an Hilbert space norm in this exact same order that I discussed, right? Infimum outside of the norm. Now, what, what I'll be discussing, so I'll not discuss the details of this because it's mathematically a little more challenging and it's not terribly intuitive. It's not gonna be very helpful because we cannot construct a unitary explicitly. The weak distance has the benefit that we could construct it explicitly and the explicit um, result is gonna be this object that we defined earlier, the co-cycle. It's defined again, it's a unitary, one parameter unitary flow. It's defined for any two states and the choice of the region that I'm suppressing here. So this is u of psi omega t of a, and it's only, so this is the definition of it. It belongs to the algebra of left, for example, a. On the right side, it's just identity. It simply does not act on the right side. Um, and this should be clear from the form that I wrote down. So if you remember, delta of omega psi was psi tensor, omega minus one. If I take into a power of i t, it's going to be psi to a power of i t, tensor, omega to a power of minus i t. You do the same thing here, omega to a power of minus i t and omega to a power of i t will cancel out and give you identity here. And on the other side, you're gonna end up with psi to a power of i t, omega to minus i t. So you could work this out. You know, if that was too quick, you could work this out. So, this is a unitary that you act with on a state and uh, you locally change, bring, you, you locally change the state. You could symmetrize it by, uh, by the action of the um, modular conjugation. This is basically a unitary on the left and a corresponding unitary on the right after the action of the modular conjugation. Remember the modular conjugation was canonically relating left to the right. So differently, if you wanted to create a state from the vacuum by the action of U, and you wanted, you wanted it to stay the, to pick a representation that is a canonical purification, you'll have to do exactly this. You have to do UT tensor U of J of T. Well, in quantum filter, you wouldn't put tensor, but just multiply. And this is basically what it, this object is basically the module. Oh, by the way, this, so I, I, I did not explain this notation. Every time I put one, one um, index, it means that both of them are the same. And that thing is called modular flow. This is modular flow of the first operator to evolve backwards and the second, the second state evolves forward. The one parameter family of states chi t, so, now, we call this chi of u, right? Because um, it's just a vector. The, the chi of u is important that doesn't have a, it's not normalized to have norm one, right? And this u is a particular unitary, and I'm gonna pick it to be the co-cycle that depends on one parameter t, so I can define chi of t, right? By the algebra that I discussed before, and it might have been a little bit too quick, but um, we could just like, plug back in, um, this is this chi t, if you want it to be from a canonical, uh, a canonical pur purification, is basically the co-cycle u, I'm, I'm suppressing the indices, u j acting on the vacuum, acted upon by this relative modular operator minus one. Now you use these identities, it doesn't matter, you end up with this expression, let's go to the next line. And at the end of the day, what you would like to do is that you would like the overlap of phi, an arbitrary state with chi of t, this guy, the one parameter family that you constructed, to be small, right? Now, this function, as a function of time, will have a Fourier transform, 
And the limit of t going to infinity of this function corresponds to the infinite Fourier mode of chi of t. This is exactly the Riemann Lebesgue lemma I talked about before. So, and uh, the, um, what was I, sorry. You could, you could run the argument. I think, I think I will need a blackboard to write a few lines to fill in the, these gaps. You could, you could look up the paper as well. It's just one or two lines to fill in the gap in between the two and show that this, this object, this operator, um, if you take the limit of t going to infinity of f of t, you're going to get zero. In this business, it is important that you take the, uh, you take the weak limit, meaning that you first take the limit and then you take the supremum. Because other way around, you're not going to get this answer. All right, so what did we argue? We argued, or if you fill in those like few lines of algebra, um, you, you argue that for all states in the Hilbert space, the limit of t going to infinity of the um, code cycle act, uh, sitting in between omega and phi will be producing the other states. So if I pick any two states that are in natural, are natural um, are canonical purifications, I can go in between them using the code cycle. So what does this say? First of all, oops, sorry. It says that the co-cycle, or otherwise known as the cone co-cycle, so states. If I have two states, omega and psi, it says there is a unitary that I, send, I can sandwich my state, local state omega with, u and u dagger, that will make this guy my favorite other local state. In particular, I can make this guy locally look like psi so that if there were eigenvalues, I could sew them. So this is exactly how quantum field theory uh, avoids or like evades that matching of eigenvalues constraints. In a sense, what is happening is that the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional and um, the unitary group is incredibly large so that you could make the local state using unitaries very, very close to any other state. This is what you could do. So what does it say for physics? It says that take an arbitrary state, split the space time into a bunch of patches, then you could make, you, it's like a Xerox machine. You could move a Xerox machine in different parts of the space and copy, print, vacuum here, only using unitaries. So you just copy vacuum here, vacuum here, vacuum here, and vacuum here. What you have done, you have not touched the entanglement structure of um, these patches of space, space time in quantum field theory, you have totally preserved it because you just unit, use unitaries. However, you strip down, you got rid of local details. So if you want, this is like, it takes a state and gives you the skeleton of the entanglement structure, washing out all the irrelevant details. So the, the, the next natural step, it would be to try to use this as some sort of a, um, if you want to study, say, entangled entanglement structure of some highly complicated state like n equal force of Yang mills you could mimic the same sort of structure using C equal one free bosons. So if, you, if the phenomenon, if the universal phenomenon that you're interested in has to do with the entanglement structure, you could re reproduce, you could recreate the same entanglement structure in that complicated n equal four super Yang mills without ever worrying about all the complicated supersymmetry and all that using just free bosons. You could reproduce it. This is like very tensor networky, but done right. People have discussed continuum uh, tensor diagram, uh, ten tensor networks, can, uh, continuum mirror, but usually the issue with those things is that uh, they either work with, um, they work well in, the, in non-relative, they work really well in non-relativistic limit, in the relativistic limit, they usually work well only at, uh, for the free theory. And the, the origin of it is really the infinite entanglement structure, uh, in, entanglement entropies or ill-defined entanglement entropies. All right, um, with that, I come to the conclusions and the summary of it. So what did we say? We said that quantum field theory is special quantum mechanical system with some counterintuitive 
feature that the local unitaries group is very, very large. So the orbits are much larger than you would expect. And this is consequential for entanglement theory. So if you are interested in entanglement theory, you should take this result seriously. You might not be interested in it, which is a different, <laughs> different thing. And um, in particular, the counterintuitive part is that only by acting with unit, local unitaries, you could make, you could print your favorite state on each of these regions. So the structure of quantum uh, correlations are preserved, but you could copy whatever you want here, keeping the same structure. And for me, the most important lesson coming out of this going forward is that it suggests that there might be a theory of multi-particle quantum entanglement in QFTs that is a lot easier to tame than that of quantum mechanics. Because in the case of quantum mechanics, it quickly ties into deep math problems. So here we might have a shot at understanding uh, the structure because it might have been it might be much much simpler be exactly because of the soaring problem all right uh that's it thanks so much thanks any questions uh, i have one question yes uh so uh, can you try to could you like try to somehow use this construction to like uh, construct uh, multi-partite multi uh, measures of entanglement? Yes, this is, the most, the, this is the, exactly the next natural thing to do. And the answer is yes, and this is exactly what we're doing. So um, I would say there are many, as is typical in quantum mechanics or entanglement theory, in entanglement theory, usually there's a compromise between um, how uh, well, the quantity you write down represents how uh, faithful it is to the properties you want and how easy it is to calculate, right? This is the case for at least quantum mechanics, uh, in multi party entanglement theory in quantum mechanics. And usually the structure is that the most natural thing to do that is very representative of what you would like from entanglement theory is to define a cone of states, a convex cone of states, and take define your measure as an infimum over various unitaries acting on this cone. I don't know, this might be a little bit too abstract, but uh, basically, usually the, the multi-party entanglement measures, the, the ideal ones are defined as infimum over a bunch of uh, unitary group rotations, unitary orbits. This is the way it works in multi-party quantum entanglement, or one way that it works in multi-party quantum entanglement. Here, you could try to mimic that structure, and there's a good chance that you make progress. So, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I, I'm happy to talk offline afterwards about this endlessly, because but that's what we're doing now. Uh, okay, and uh, it, like, is this the, uh, the same construction as it was done for the reflected entropy? Like, does it somehow, somehow relate, but like only for bi bipartite entanglement? So, uh, that's a... That's a very, very good question. And um, I do not understand uh, that discussion all that well, but I can tell you a few things. Uh, every, every measure that essentially uses canonical purification has some elements that is very natural in this language. And another thing I can say is that these co-cycles that I'm talking about were even though they were not their intuition and why they were useful were not was not discovered, but they were used by Tom Faulkner and uh, friends to prove QNEC quantum null energy condition. They're, they literally took this co-cycle and took the limit of t going to infinity, and uh, at, uh, without really knowing why this is good, they just wrote down a set of things that worked. But um, I think. Well, okay, so I, I should just say that I don't know the connection with reflected entropy, but I know that as there, there's a good chance, it's plausible. <laughs> it's plausible. Uh, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. If not, then let's thank Nima again.